Hello, Facebook. <clears throat> Hello, Facebook. Prophet David Taylor here for my Thursday night session of No More Genies. Now, for those of you that are new to what No More Genies is, uh, long story short, it's me doing teachings on getting rid of the genie concept of God, where we think that we just wave a magic wand or say a magic word and God just waves his mighty hand and just does what we want as if he's a genie, as if life works that way, as if his kingdom works that way. We need to get rid of our genie concept of God and we need to get an actual factual from scripture basis concept of God so that we can preach and teach the right thing. So what I've been working on is uh, instead of teaching people to preach what we call the gospel of Jesus Christ, born again, born again, get saved, get saved, miss hell, miss hell, go to church, go to church, go to heaven when you die. That's not what Jesus preached. We need to look at what Jesus actually preached, and we're supposed to preach what Jesus preached, not that fake gospel that we made up. What the Lord actually uh, preached was the kingdom. The kingdom of God is like this. The kingdom of God is like that. The kingdom of heaven is like this. The kingdom of heaven is like that. That's what Jesus preached. So that's what we've been taking a look at. So let's have a quick word of prayer, and then we're going to dive into, because I'm going through uh, all the things, not all of them, but uh, the main analogies that Jesus used to describe the kingdom of heaven. I'm going through those parables slash analogies one by one, so we can exegete and get revelation and see what the Lord was talking about, because that's what's supposed to be impacting our lives now, and that's what we're supposed to be preaching and teaching, what he preached and taught. Oh, still have my gloves on. Still have my weightlifting gloves on. I meant to take them off <laughs> if I came off of this, but that's all right. Okay, good. Now, there's my regular hand. All right, great. So let's have a word of prayer. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you for this time. Thank you for an opportunity, oh God, to come before your presence. Thank you, oh God, that you are great and mighty and powerful and that you never change. And there's not even a shadow of turning. Thank you that you are always there, that we can always call on you. And that's why you're our rock. And that's why you are covering. That's why you, you are all the things that you are. That's why you are all the things that you are, oh God, because you don't change. And, and we can call on you anytime, and that's just awesome. So I surrender to you right now, God. Fill me with the Holy Ghost. Breathe through my mouth. Speak through my mouth, my eyes, my hands, my lips, my brain, oh God. Take over and breathe the message through me that you want released to the body of Christ and into the world. And I just thank you so humbly for letting me be a part of your kingdom and letting me be a part of your program, for it's truly an honor to be used by God. And I just thank you for it, for your kindness. And it's, it's in Jesus' name we pray. We go forth with expectation for you to have your way in this program. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, and amen and amen. So let us dive right in and uh, get into tonight's teaching. Now, so far, I've talked about the parable of the sower, uh, the parable of the wheat and the tares, the parable of the mustard seed, the parable, parable of the yeast and the leaven. So tonight, this is number five on this teaching, I'm going to talk about the parable of the hidden treasure, and that is Matthew chapter 13, verse 44. Matthew chapter 13 verse 44. Now Matthew is the first book in the New Testament. Okay? So just go right to the middle of your Bible and right go right to where the New Testament starts. Matthew is the first book coming out of chapter 13 verse 44. Now I explained to you in the very first video on this series about the difference between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. They were aimed at different audiences and uh, some of the audiences could receive uh, the wordings better than others. So let me pull that up. Uh, Matthew wrote his gospel to reach a Jewish audience. Okay? Remember that Jews don't say the full name of God. They don't say Yahweh or Jehovah. They don't even write his name out of fear or respect because they had that experience where God came down and even Moses was afraid. Um, so uh, if Matthew kept using the phrase kingdom of God, kingdom of God, that would be offensive to the Jewish ear because it would sound like they were breaking the third commandment and taking the Lord's name in vain and not honoring and reverencing his name. So that's why Matthew tends to use the phrase kingdom of heaven, 
kingdom of heaven, kingdom of heaven. And all the other gospels use primarily the kingdom of God. Although Matthew does use kingdom of God a few times when he's directly quoting Jesus. But again, just a little background. I've said that before. I just want to repeat that here. Okay, so tonight, again, uh, Matthew 13, 44. I'm reading out of the New International Version. Uh, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. Well, okay, it's just one verse on that one, uh, but let's get behind that language and see what the Holy Spirit has to say to us today, okay? Matthew says, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of heaven, okay, properly royalty, a rule or a realm, that's what kingdom means, heaven is the sky, heaven, happiness, power, eternity. Remember I told you you can also say the kingdom of eternity. That makes a huge difference because one of the things that the Lord taught was that his kingdom was everlasting. So that's why he said, we're fools if we don't invest with God. Remember the parable that Jesus told about the rich man that had so much money, he had to tear down his barns and build new and bigger barns because he had so much harvest. He didn't have a place to hold all that he had. And God came up to him and said, thou fool. And he said, God, why are you calling me a fool? He said, because you're going to die tonight. Your soul is required of you tonight. And then all that stuff you built, who's it going to belong to then? And the Lord concludes that story by saying, so is he that is not rich towards God. So in other words, God says, if we don't invest in the kingdom of eternity, if we don't invest in that thing that's going to last forever, we're fools. Because that means we are investing in said, instead in the earthly kingdoms that are, by definition, temporary. Uh, my, one of my pastor mentors used to say all the time, whatever you can hold in your hand, you're not going to hold it very long. So anything that we invest in that's here, some stuff we have to invest in here, but it is, by definition, temporary. So the Lord gives us an opportunity. You hear me say that all the time. The Lord gives us an opportunity to invest in his eternal kingdom. And he said, if we don't do that, we're fools. So the kingdom of eternity, the kingdom of the sky, the kingdom of forever, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, is like treasure. Now, what's that word in Greek? Uh, Thesauro, uh, Strong's 2344, a storehouse for precious things, hence a treasure, a store, a deposit, or wealth. Okay? So it's like a storehouse, a treasure, a storehouse for precious things, hidden in a field. And when a man found it, okay, he hid it again. And in his joy, he went out and sold all he had and bought that field. So what is the Lord telling us here? Well, he's telling us that, first of all, the kingdom of heaven is hidden. Now, this is one of the reasons that people that are not saved, unbelievers, and people that don't have the Holy Ghost, that's why they laugh at us as Christians. That's why they talk about us, because they keep saying, you believe in a God you made up. He's not real. You know, he's just a myth. He's just imaginary, and blah, 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 blah. Okay, but we know as believers that Father God is very real, and Jesus Christ is real, only because of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is the one that makes the difference. Let me look that scripture up. Because uh, I want you to see where the Lord actually says that in the scripture. Okay, that's in John chapter 14, okay? John chapter 14, verses 16 and 17 says, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot receive him, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you do know him, for he abides with you and will be in you. Wow! So the Lord is telling us there in no uncertain terms, I mean, he can't really make that any more plain, can he? That the world, uh, people that are not regenerated, unbelievers, sinners, uh, they can't receive the Holy Ghost because they don't see him and they don't know him. So when they're making fun of us as Christians, talking about we believe in an imaginary God, blah, 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 blah. Sometimes the Spirit of God gives you a glimpse into the spiritual world. And that particular experience is much more concentrated in prophets intercessors and seers 
Um, you can see in the spirit, or many of you have been able to see in the spirit from a child. And uh, it's not something you can convince other people of, nor do you have to. But it's something that's very, very real. And sometimes the Lord will just pull the cover back, okay, and let you see what's going on in the invisible world. Let's look at an instance of that in the Bible. That would be 2 Kings 6, 15 and 16. 2 Kings 6, 15 and 16. Uh, when the servant of the man of God, talking about Elisha, uh, Gehazi was a servant, but the man of God is talking about Elisha. When the servant of the man of God got up and went out early in the morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. So he asked Elisha, O oh my master, what are we to do? Do not be afraid, Elisha answered, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Then Elisha prayed, O oh Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw that the hills were full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Wow. Now that is a prime example of what I mean, what it means to be a spirit-filled believer as opposed to someone that's not saved or born again. They can't experience stuff like that. They can't see stuff like that. They can't receive the Holy Ghost. But God sometimes can pull the cover back and you can all of a sudden see that you're not out there by yourself, that there are horses and chariots of fire and angels and the, the heavenly host is there to support you when you're walking in obedience to the will of God. Okay? That, you hear me say it all the time. That's one of the benefits. That's one of the advantages to being a Christian. Why would you not take full advantage of what the Lord died to give you? Why would you not? That doesn't make any sense. So, uh, so the Holy Ghost is the one that helps us see that which is in the spiritual world. It's hidden from unbelievers and sinners and the unregenerate, but we can see it as Christians, not because of anything that we do, so please don't get that idea. Please get that idea out of your head that we are somehow self-righteous or it's because of anything that we did. Never, ever, ever let those thoughts grow in your head that there's something special about you or your demographics or something that you did. It's because of God's goodness, his promise to us because of him wanting us to walk by faith and stay encouraged and to know that we are not alone. And so sometimes the Spirit of God gives you a glimpse into what's going on in the spiritual world. So the Lord said that his kingdom is like a treasure hidden. It's hidden. You can't perceive it with your natural eye. Okay? You cannot perceive God's kingdom with your natural eye. So it's just like a treasure hidden in the field. But when a man found it, and I just told you how you can find it, the Spirit of God has to reveal it to you, okay? Because remember that we don't find God. Sometimes people say, I found Jesus. <laughs> you did not find Jesus, as Bishop Jake says, that would imply that the Lord was lost. The Lord is not the one that was lost. We're the ones that are lost, okay? So what actually happens is, because the Lord is ever-present, he opens our eyes to him. He reveals himself to us and then we can see him but we most certainly did not find him so uh but when the spirit of god gives you revelation on that hidden treasure he hid it again and what does that mean that means he didn't really tell anybody from the jump what he had found <laughs> hidden in that field but in his joy he went and sold all that he had and bought that field so what is the Lord trying to tell us there? The Lord is trying to tell us there that not only is the kingdom of heaven hidden and not only is it hidden treasure, but when you find it, for the joy that you find in it, that you're going to go and sell all that you have to buy the field where that treasure is. So what does that mean in practical terms? What that means is that you will discover if you ever fully give yourself to Christ and fully give yourself to Christ's teaching and ever fully give yourself to the kingdom of heaven, that it is actually what you're looking for, that the kingdom of heaven is actually the thing that can produce what you're looking for. For example, in the kingdom of heaven, there is true forgiveness. You can search all over this earth. You can try all other kinds of religions. You can try meditation. You can try counseling. You can try penance. You can try a whole bunch of things. But if you want true forgiveness, that's found in the kingdom of heaven. Because Jesus' blood is the only agent that has the power 
to forgive sin, and it's the only substance that's accepted before God's throne and mercy seat as adequate payment for sin because it's the only sinless blood that there is. There is no other blood on earth that doesn't have the taint of sin in it. So it would not be accepted before God's throne as payment because it's already corrupted. For example, you couldn't cut yourself and then offer that up to God and say, now forgive me of my sins because your blood is tainted. The blood of Jesus is clean and powerful and it's the only blood that's accepted in heaven as the forgiveness, the payment of sin. That means God can offer you true forgiveness. He can apply the blood to your account and wipe the debt out of your account. And nobody else can do that. You can't find that anywhere else. You can't find that kind of forgiveness and you can't find peace anywhere else. That's why the Lord is saying it's a treasure, his kingdom. Okay? You can't find guaranteed returns. Now, I need to talk a lot more about <laughs> the so-called, you've heard me say it before, you've heard me talk about the so-called prosperity gospel. Uh, there's no such thing as prosperity gospel because prosperity has always been a part of the gospel. So in other words, the good news about dealing with God is that if you believe and obey God, you will always get increase. You will always get a harvest. You will always end up with more than you started. And you can't find, start it with, and you can't find anybody in the Bible that obeyed God and didn't increase. That's not possible. So there's really no such thing as prosperity gospel. You know, they say, you know, this person is a prosperity preacher, and they believe in the prosperity gospel. There's no such thing, because prosperity has always been a part of the gospel. Obedience to God always brings prosperity increase and many different kinds of wealth, not just money wealth, okay? But there is such a thing as the false prosperity gospel, and sometimes people get the two confused. The false prosperity gospel is the one that's cropped up that says you can live any kind of way you want to, you can do whatever you want, and still be blessed by God. That ain't nowhere in the scripture. That is a lie. There's nowhere in the scripture where God ever says, or any situation that ever unfolds where people just did whatever they wanted to do and God said, I'm just going to give you the full blessing, I'm going to give you the full everything regardless of how you behave and what you believe and what you say. That ain't nowhere in the scripture. That's the false prosperity gospel. That's what a lot of people have been sold in today's society, in today's religious situations. And that's why so many people are being disappointed because they've been sold a bill of goods that told them that there doesn't have to be any repentance. Repentance does not mean to stop doing something. Repentance from scripture actually means to change your mind. So when God calls you to repent, he calls you to crucify and lay down your thoughts and receive his word, his commandments and his thoughts and let that be the Lord over your life instead of what you thought. Then you'll live differently because you'll be thinking differently. Okay? But the false part... False prosperity gospel is the one that's telling people that you can do whatever you want to do. Any lifestyle choice, any decision that you make, any attitude, any words that come out of your mouth, anything you want to do, and God will bless you anyway in the name of love. All that is a lie. Okay? That's not what scripture teaches, and that's never been true. And there would have been no need for animal sacrifices and then the Lord's sacrifice if God was just going to accept whatever you did, regardless of how you behaved. That doesn't even make any sense. Okay? So, but the Lord, but in his kingdom, the Lord said that you can find that true forgiveness. You can find true increase because when you HBO, when you hear, believe, and obey God, there's no way you don't get increase. There is no way you don't get increase. There's no way you don't get increase. Okay? My pastor, Apostle John Eckhart, says it all the time. He says he kept on sowing. He said he had good times, he had rough times. He said, but he kept on sowing, he kept on believing, he kept on confessing, and God just took him from level to level, faith to faith, and glory to glory, because he kept sowing into the kingdom. And that's why the kingdom of heaven is such a hidden treasure. Because I want you to think about the times in your life where you have sowed into other places and you didn't get the return that you wanted. Uh, on the financial tip, let's say the stock market, or let's say an IPO. Uh, you're investing in a company and maybe you have a chance to get in on the ground floor or get in on a startup. And let's say you put some money in that company or you put some money in that 
initial public offering, and it just didn't pan out. Let's say you invested in a relationship. Let's say you got married, and let's say you thought, or maybe you wanted to get married, and you thought that this person was going to be in your life until one or both of you died, and it didn't work out that way. Let's say you tried to raise a child, and you did the best you could, and you poured everything you knew how into that child for 16, 18, 20, 22, 25 years, and that child still curses you to your face, and that child still doesn't want to hear anything you have to say. So there are definitely situations in life where you can sow and sow and still not get the harvest that you wanted through a variety of reasons and circumstances. But we all know that it's happened. Uh, bad business deals. Sometimes you sign contracts with people in good faith. And sometimes you do everything you know how to do to hold up your end of the deal. And what do they give you in return? They give you poor service. They give you poor products. They show up late and leave early. Uh, they don't keep their end of the deal. They don't honor the contract that they signed. They, there's a lot of things that they don't do that they should. Okay? So all of us have experienced that at some point. But the Lord is saying in his kingdom, it doesn't work that way. And there's, there's nothing you could sow into Jesus and the kingdom of heaven without some type of guaranteed return. Even your tears. There's a scripture that, that says that God puts all of our tears in a bottle. Did you know that? Let me look that up for you so you can see that I'm not making that up. God, tears in a bottle. Even your tears. Okay. And that is Psalm 56, verse 8. Psalm chapter 56, verse 8. You, have, you meaning God, have taken account of my wanderings. You have put my tears into your bottle. Are they not in your book? So they're not only in God's bottle, but God also writes down every time you cry. Did you know that? That means there's nothing that you give to God that he doesn't take seriously, that he doesn't keep a record of, that, that is lost on him. And sometimes the Lord can answer years and years and years worth of prayer and years and years and years worth of tears like that because he's been counting them he's been recording them he's been holding them he's been watching you cry he's been feeling the pain in your heart and one day the bible says that um hope deferred maketh the heart sick but when the desire comes it is a tree of life do you know why you know why it's a tree of life to you because the lord answered your pr your prayer in spite of all that pain and all those tears that you cried so nothing is wasted uh, there's a verse that says he that gives a cup of cold water in Jesus' name, shall in no wise lose his reward. There's a verse that says, he that uh, basically sows into or invests or receives a profit shall receive a profit's reward. So what is the Lord trying to tell us? The Lord is trying to tell us is that there is no chance of you not getting a return if you invest in his kingdom. There's, excuse me, there's no chance. You will get a harvest, you will get a return, you will get an increase when you invest in the kingdom of heaven. And that's why the Lord is saying here that it's like a treasure hidden in the field. That once you realize what it is, and that's another point that I want to bring out, you have to stay with it long enough for the harvest to come. This is why I call this teaching No More Genies. That's why I started this whole teaching on No More Genies, because, because God has all power. Many times we approach him as if he's magic, as if even though God can cause something to happen instantly, God can cause it to spring up overnight. And when we call unto God and he answers our prayers, he answers them as soon as we set our heart and our mouths to pray. He releases the answer from heaven. But Daniel chapter 10 tells us that sometimes there's a fight from when the answer leaves heaven to when it gets us, gets to us on earth. And that's why we have to keep praying, keep believing and stay in faith. Because sometimes God released the angel with the answer and a demon flew in. <clears throat> in the second heaven and fought. They're fighting that angel. They're still fighting because remember that demons and angels still fight. And that demon trying to intercept that angel, trying to stop him from getting through. And that's why we have to pray and praise and confess because praise in particular uh, but also uh, confession of the word gives angels a homing beacon. Did you know that? Did you know that angels are attuned to the sound of heaven? And the sound of heaven is praise and worship of God. Angels are attuned to the sound of heaven, and the sound of heaven is what thus saith the Lord. 
So that's one of the reasons the Holy Spirit tells us, because remember we pray, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's one of the reasons the Holy Spirit tells us to keep confessing, keep confessing the word, keep praising God. When you do that, you create the atmosphere of heaven around you. Did you know that? I know you know that if you ever go to corporate worship, but it's true in your own home. It's true in your own dwelling. When you speak the word of God, when you keep your positive confession going, and when you praise God, you create the atmosphere of heaven. And when you create the atmosphere of heaven, you give the angels a homing beacon. They know what praise sounds like. They know that. They know what the word of God is. They know that. You give the angels a homing beacon. And they need that because many times they're up there fighting with demons trying to get through with you. They're flying from heaven on the way to you with the answer. And here comes some kind of demon force trying to counter them. So that's why the Holy Spirit says stay in faith. Stay steadfast. Because we're creating a homing beacon to draw the angels and draw the blessings to you. Did you know that? So, but... You do have to stick with the kingdom of heaven long enough to get the harvest. And again, that's why I'm doing everything I can. That's why I'm laboring so hard to tear down this genie concept of God. Laboring so hard to tear down the idea that everything's just going to happen like that. Because some things will, but some things are going to take time. Now, time to manifest, not time for God to release it. Because whenever God says yes and answer, answers our prayer, as soon as it comes out of God's mouth, it's so and it's true. And it's there in the spiritual invisible realm. But I need it out here in my life. I need it out here when I get my hands on it. I need it out here in you know my day-to-day -day living. And sometimes that takes time to manifest. And that's why you have to hang in there with your prayer, with your praise, with your confession, and putting works behind your faith. So that when that thing shows up, you're ready and all that different kind of stuff. You heard me talk about that before. Okay? And so what a lot of people, the mistake that a lot of people make, which is, again, why I want to get rid of the genie concept of God. Uh, the mistake that a lot of people make is they think that if God hasn't answered them or if they can't see the answer, or if the answer hasn't manifested like that, that it's not true. And that's incorrect. And uh, remember that when the Lord healed the ten lepers, what did the Lord say? He said, go show yourselves to the priest. Now, the reason he said that is because, as a rabbi is because it was ceremonially required for uh, those that were lepers to stay outside of the main city and to cry unclean, unclean, when people would walk by them because there was no cure for leprosy. And people didn't, you know, didn't want to get infected with leprosy. So lepers had to live outside of the city and let everybody know that they weren't clean. But if a leper ever got cleansed, they had to go show themselves to the high priest and to the council of priests uh, to let them know that they were clean now and they could be reintegrated into society. So when the Lord, as a rabbi, told them, go show yourselves to the priests, the Bible says, as they went, they were cleansed. So the Lord didn't say, be clean, and then they got clean, and then they went. The Lord said, go. So they had to go. And as they went, they were cleansed. So I'm saying that to say that however God's blessings manifest, however the Lord answers your prayers, they're not all, even when God releases it instantly, when God says yes, he you know says yes the moment you pray and believe. The Lord says uh, whatever sort of things you want to believe, believe that when you pray you receive them and you shall have them. So the, the release from God is instant, but the manifestation here on earth in your life isn't always instant for a lot of reasons. Sometimes the answer has to grow to be ready. Sometimes you have to grow to be ready for the answer. Sometimes the devil's fighting hard to get it to you. You know, all kinds of different reasons. So a lot of people think that if it didn't happen instantly, that it didn't happen. I just watched a video last week about a woman that got healed. Uh, and some of you may have seen this video on Facebook because once again, I'm not making it up. This woman whose arm was, her right arm was jacked up like this. It was swollen up here, and it was jacked up, and it was bent, and it was out of shape, and it wasn't straight. And I watched them throw holy water on that woman and pray for her and speak in tongues, and, and it was almost like a special effect. And that arm came all the way down and came back normal. I'm telling you, I just watched that last week on Facebook. It was like, wow, okay? That's the healing power of God. But it didn't happen like that. They had to keep praying, keep confessing, keep believing, keep pouring holy water on her, and then that arm straightened out. That's what I'm saying. 
a lot of people do not stick with the kingdom of heaven long enough for the, answer, for the answers to manifest. But the Lord is saying that when you really understand what the kingdom of heaven is, when you really understand that what you can get out of it, and when you really understand that it's worth investing in, you're going to sell everything you have <laughs> to pour into it. Now, I'm going to say this a little bit and I'm going to be through. <laughs> I'm sorry to say that not all Christians believe that and not all Christians do that. Now, that comes from an earlier teaching when the Lord is talking about the wheat and the tares and also when the Lord is talking about 30, 60, 100 fold. Because the Bible does tell us that everybody is not going to respond to the word of God the same way. So I know that a lot of unbelievers, a lot of people that are critics of the Bible, critics of Christians and critics of Jesus, say things like, well, you Christians are hypocrites. Well, you don't believe your own tenements. Well, I thought you're supposed to be a Christian. You're supposed to be saved, blah, 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 blah. Okay. Everybody does not believe or follow God at the same level or with the same zeal or with the same commitment or with the same fervor. That doesn't mean that God isn't real. And that doesn't mean that the Bible isn't real. And that doesn't mean that Jesus isn't real. And that doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit isn't real. What it means is that everybody does not have the same response to him. And I want to say this for a long time. If you want maximum results, maximum results require maximum obedience. I've been wanting to say that for a long time. Because again, anything else is a genie concept. You think you can give God 10% and reap 110%. You're going to reap what you sow. As the Bible says that if you sow sparingly, you're going to reap sparingly. And as the Bible says, if you sow bountifully, you're going to reap bountifully. Okay? That's the way it works. And so, a lot of believers, I'm talking about actual born-again people, card-carrying Christians, we do not all believe God at the same level. We do not believe God with the same level of commitment, the same fervor, the same anything. And so, critics, those outside of the kingdom, outside of Christianity, say, see, that stuff ain't real. See, blah, 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 and that's not true. But if you want to get the maximum out of the kingdom of heaven, I'll say it again. I'll give it to you in principle form, because whenever somebody gives you something in principle form, it's always easier to remember. If you want maximum results from God and his kingdom, maximum results requires maximum obedience. That is how Jesus got to where he is right now. The Lord has the royal diadem. A diadem is not just a crown. The diadem means the crown of crowns. That's why he's the king of kings. And he's the Lord of lords. The Lord has a name that's above every name. The Lord is not the only one with a name. There are other beings, other people, other everything that has a name. But he has a name that's above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. And every tongue should confess that Jesus is Lord. Well, do you know why the Father rewarded him with that? The Father rewarded Jesus with that because Jesus obeyed Father to the max. Because Jesus never deviated from the Father's will for his life. And even when he struggled with it in the Garden of Gethsemane, with going through with the cross experience, being arrested, being beaten, being spit upon, being stripped of his clothes, being humiliated, being crucified, hanging on the cross for six hours, and going in the grave and going down to hell. That's what the Father wanted Jesus to do. And Jesus didn't want to do that. He wrestled with that in the Garden of Gethsemane. But he came up out of the Garden of Gethsemane saying, not my will, but thine be done. He decided to go through with it. He decided to obey Father to the max. That is why Jesus has the crown of crowns. That's why Jesus has a name above every name. That's why Jesus was told by Father, sit down until I make your enemies your footstool. That's why the Lord got everything that he got, because he obeyed. He obeyed. He obeyed God to the max. I can't stress that enough. And what has happened with the false prosperity gospel, when people say things like, well, God said you're the head and you're not the tail. That's not what that scripture says. Deuteronomy 28 is so misquoted. That's not what the scripture says. The scripture says that it shall come to pass that if you hearken unto the voice of the Lord your God, 
uh, uh, to observe and to hearken diligently to the voice of the Lord your God, to observe and to do all his commandments, that then all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you. That's actually what the scripture says. Let me read it for you so you understand I'm not making that up. I'm going to read you Deuteronomy 28. Okay, I'm reading out of the King James Version. Deuteronomy 28.1 says, And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all his commandments which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee high above, all, set thee on high above all nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee, if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. So the Bible, what the Bible actually says is that those blessings only come if you're listening to God. And you have to listen diligently, and you have to observe and do everything the Lord is telling you to do. That's right there. That's how you get maximum blessing. Maximum blessing requires maximum obedience. And the Lord Jesus Christ lived that principle out, and that's why he's seated at the right hand of the Father right now, waiting for his enemies to be made his footstool, because he obeyed God 100% across the board, holding nothing back. And so, as believers, we have to grow to the point where we obey God on that level, where you obey God 100%, everything he says all the time, not holding back. And we're not going to be sin-free. We're not going to be mistake-free. But you have to grow as you walk with God. And as you walk with God in obedience, that's how your harvest and your increase and in everything grows. And if you are unbelieving and disobedient, then you will never get the harvest that God wanted you to have. That's not God, because there's he's no respect of a person. What he's done for one, he'll do for you. It is no secret what God can do. What he's done for others, he'll do for you. Because the Bible says over 26 times, there's no respect of persons with God. That's not God, that's the problem. Is that you did not believe, you did not HBO, you did not hear him, believe him, and obey him long enough for the full blessing to manifest. Because everything is an instant. Just like when your mother gets pregnant with you, it takes three quarters of a year for you to grow, to be able to live outside of your mom. Then it takes you 13 years to be 13 years old. That's just old enough to be awkward. <laughs> you see what I mean? I mean, so that's what I'm trying to say. So I say that because I want you to be encouraged and not discouraged. I want you to hang in there and continue to HBO, continue to hear, believe, and obey God and understand that there's no way you won't reap a harvest because the kingdom of heaven is a place where we have guaranteed harvest, that there is nothing that we invest with God that is lost or wasted. As I, I told you before that scripture, even your tears, even your tears are so important to God, he keeps them in a bottle and writes them in a book because a, there's a book God has in heaven of your life, and that book starts, well, the book actually starts before you're born, but when God is forming you in your mother's womb, one side of that book has the will of God on it, all the things he wants to do every day of your life. And the other side of that book is blank, and God writes down on it what you choose to do with your life. And so that's why when you stand before God in judgment, the book of your life is there. Because God says, here's everything I wanted to do, and here's everything you said and did. And he's going to judge you according to what you said and did. That's in Psalm 139, where uh, in that book, all my members or all my days were written before they were formed, okay? So God already has a plan for your life when your mom is pregnant with you. And whatever you do with your life is your choice, and God writes that down too. But there is nothing that you invest in God that's wasted. Not a tear, not a prayer, not a cup of cold water, nothing. So that's why the Lord is saying in this parable that his kingdom is a hidden treasure. But once you really understand what it is, because who doesn't want a guaranteed harvest? Don't we spend our lives running around trying to get a harvest? Don't we spend all of our days on earth trying to get, <laughs> trying to get a harvest, trying to get relationships, trying to get money, trying to get attention, trying to get, don't we do that? And sometimes the bottom falls out and the roof caves in and we don't know why. That's because when you're investing in anything other than the kingdom, there's no guarantee. But when you invest in the kingdom of heaven, it's going to be a guaranteed harvest. It will not fail. Might not look like what you thought. Might not come the way you thought. But it's going to give a return. That's why the Lord says it's worth 
selling all that you have to buy the field where the kingdom of heaven is so you can invest everything you've got in that kingdom. But I stopped by to tell you, as a believer, you have to grow to that point. It's not going to seem that way when you first get saved. When you first start walking with Christ, it's not going to seem that way. But you have to stay with it long enough to see that manifest. Okay? All right. That's our teaching for tonight. Uh, anybody watching me live, if you have any prayer requests, put them on the screen right now. And uh, uh, let me see them. I'll pray for them right now. Now, when you see me close my eyes and uh, speak in tongues, I'm talking to the Holy Ghost, asking him, if there's any more prophetic words, any financial words, any demons that need to be cast out, and um, any, uh, anything that needs to be broken off, any more uh, physical healing that needs to manifest, okay? All right, here we go. All right, prophetic word, somebody. Okay, Mrs. G has said, I would like to operate in a prophetic. Okay, hold on one second. Prophetic word came to me is the Lord is saying to somebody in my family, one of my cousins, and also those of you that have uh, uh, a sick mother, to fear not, because your mother's going to be well. I got that prophetic word to my cousin and also to those of you that are dealing with an ailing mother, to fear not, because your mother's going to be well. Now, Mrs. G, you want to operate in the prophetic. All right. Uh, that is, uh, there are a couple books I can recommend. I'm actually coming out with a prophetic devotional next year in January to help people deal with that thing, to have a day-by-day -day kind of journal where you can operate in the prophetic. If you want to know the scripture to start with, you want to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 14 to begin your study of the prophetic. And then there are some books I would recommend by my pastor, Apostle John Eckhart. Um, one of the best ones is... God Still Speaks, okay? That's a book by Apostle John Eckhart entitled God Still Speaks. And that's one of the best books I've ever read about understanding the prophetic, what it is, and getting started with it. So if you want to get started right away, I recommend going to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, beginning to read those verses, and then picking up a copy of God Still Speaks by Apostle John Eckhart. And then I will have my prophetic uh, journal, my prophetic uh, workbook out, uh, January 1st, because it's, it's going to have a scripture for every day. And you'll be able to meditate on the scripture and ask the Holy Spirit to give you revelation on that scripture and what God is saying to you today through that scripture. And then there's a section where you can write down the blessings that you get. So that's my prophetic devotional uh, coming out in uh, just over six weeks. So I'm super excited about it, and I will definitely do a launch and let people know. But Mrs. Gia, that's, that's the place to start. I hope that helped you. I hope that helped you because walking in the prophetic is a lifelong study. It's never ending. It's not, you know, something I could encapsulate. Uh, amen. God bless you. So, yeah. So, yeah. So, uh, so let me see if there's anything that the Holy Ghost, anything else the Holy Ghost wants me to release. Okay, the Holy Ghost just said to me, hold your head up for the blessing is nigh. If that's for me, I'll receive it. And for those of you that that applies to, if you want to grab that. Now, you need to understand something about the prophetic word. When an apostle or a prophet releases a word and they release something in the atmosphere, you can grab it and use your faith to pull that blessing in your life. Did you know that? Bishops, apostles, and prophets in particular, amen, she receives it. When they release stuff, it can break stuff off of your life, but it can also pull blessings into your life. So the Spirit of God just said to me, hold your head up, for the blessing is not. I received that for myself, and I released that, so whoever else that is for, Miss Gia, you know, receive that and believe that. Because remember, the angels are on the way with the blessing, and we have to stay in faith because many times they have to fight through. So we got to keep praising God, keep confessing the word, and keep believing so we can draw those blessings to us like a homing beacon, because the angels are looking for heaven on earth. They're looking for the environment that they know. Worship, prayer, praise, confession. Okay? Amen and amen. Okay, let me see if there's anything else.
Okay. I think that think that's it. All right. Amen. And God bless you. Thank you so much for those of you that tuned in to watch me live. God bless you. Those of you that are listening to the podcast or watching the replay on YouTube. Uh, I really want you to work. Thank you, Mrs. G. God bless you too. Really want you to work hard to get rid of that genie concept of God. Get rid of those myths, those false teachings, those false ideas you might have about God. And watch these videos so you can do a deep dive into the Word. I do a deep dive into the Word so we can see what the Scripture actually says. So we can be preaching and teaching and believing and saying the right things. And so we can look for the manifest uh, of the blessing in the right way, according to what the Scripture says, and not according to some magic, genie, magic word, rubbing the magic lamp concept of God. Okay? All right. Amen. And God bless you. Uh, I should be on again next month. Second Thursday of December for the last No More Genies of this year. Then also remember, at the end of December and the beginning of January, I do something called a prophetic locator word. At the end of the year, you need to go before the Lord and ask him to give you your grades. Ask the Lord how you did this year. Because you don't want to keep spending year after year out of the will of God. So you have to ask Jesus to give you your grades for the year. That's a prophetic locator word at the end of the year. Then at the beginning of the year... 1st of January, we do a located word where we ask the Lord, what's your plan for this year? Because I want to remind you that the Lord has already lived 2020. Every day of 2020, Jesus has already lived it and walked through it. And the Lord already knows everything that's going to happen in 2020. And he's already experienced it. He's already lived it. So what you want to do at the beginning of a new year is ask the Lord to put you in his perfect will. Ask the Lord what he wants you to do this year and this season so that you don't waste any time being out of the will of God. So I give those two prophetic located words at the end of a year and then the next day at the beginning of the next year. So look for that on my YouTube channel, end of December, beginning of January. And then I'll see you next month for the last No More Genies of this year. And then I will see you on Sunday for my weekly live prophetic word at 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. I'm on on Facebook Live and Periscope with the weekly live prophetic word. Okay? All right. Thank you. God bless you. Friend of God forever. Blessings. Amen. God bless you. Thank you so much. God bless you. Have a great rest of your night. Have a great rest of your week. And I'll see you next time.